Hey everybody, what's going on? It's Spencer from Gray Capital. Our goal is to make sure you've got all the necessary information, the best information uh, to really kind of keep you on track and help you make some really smart decisions. Because whether you're investing, whether you're running an apartment community, whatever it is, um, we want to make sure you've got everything you need to know from the macro and on that local micro level as well. So let's just get into the report. All right, once again, we're bringing in Matt Bosnagel, Director of Communications and Marketing here at Gray Capital. Um, you know, it's often, it's an exciting week for us, Matt. Um, but we're talking about all-time highs, whether it's stock market, cryptocurrencies, uh, you know, the private art market, and of course, real estate. But how's your week going, Matt? How, how are these market fluctuations and all-time highs affecting your your day-to-day? -day? How's the emotion? My blood that? pressure has not increased. I think, I, I think I'm doing okay. We're okay. keeping an even keel. Trying to good stuff. Okay. Well, I just want to just hop right into the report. We've got a couple um good pieces. You know, Yardy Matrix put out um a good article. Um, we're gonna compare that to the real page piece. Um, and then later on get into the more of the macro, talking about this infrastructure bill that was passed, talking about a New York Times article that came out this weekend that uh, you know, again, kind of classic New York Times writing about um, you know, about the rest of the country and not getting the full picture and kind of hanging on to more of those uh, uh, tantalizing headlines rather than really what may actually be going on. Um, so for, let's just hop right into this uh, Yardi Matrix report um, there. This is their monthly report for the month of October, You know, trying to keep us up to date as um, they do a really good job. So Matt, getting into it, what are some of the highlights? Sounds like we've got some strong rent growth, but can it keep us, get us up to speed? Yeah, Yardi Matrix um, reports just kind of what we were talking about last week, that rents uh, continue to grow. And if you really want a great look at historic multifamily rent growth this year, you really should look at our video, uh, What the Experts Got Wrong. It was last week, the, the link's in the show notes, and we discussed really how no one predicted growth at this level. Some people predicted growth, but really not. It's it's eye-opening how, how different it is now than what people predicted, and it's continuing this year. Um, I was actually expecting to read about a slowdown in growth this month from Yardi Matrix. RealPage has recorded a slowdown for October, so I was priming myself when I was reading the Yardi Matrix report. Um, but Yardi does not, it, it doesn't, they, they're not measuring the, the slowdown that RealPage. RealPage has, has a slowdown with rents uh, at 0.6% last month compared to rent growth at 1% to 2% from the months of April through September. But um, Yardi Matrix does not see fit to highlight this slowdown in that way. It says that recent signs that multifamily rent growth might slow down proved to be premature as the U.S. average asking rent increased by $23 in October to a record high of $15.72. Asking rents were up 137 and then also noteworthy, single-family home rents up 14.7% year over year. So multifamily and single-family rents are both doing great. And I also think that you can expect to see some seasonal changes in decreasing rent growth heading mm -hmm. into the fall and winter months. Um, so even that real page noted slowdown may not signal a, a cooling market. So two things, you know, is it uh, Yardy just trying to take a swipe at real page for um, saying that things are slowing down? Or is it just like, you know, they're not saying the rents are declining. They're just saying they're not growing as, at a, a, you know, incredible pace that we've never seen before that well, yeah. they still really are, but it's just not as not as much. And, and I'm wondering if maybe if real page got caught up into being almost looking at really the two transients and just, okay, just in October, um, not keeping kind of the larger big picture in mind and still you know, almost downplaying. It's like, Hey, we, in any other year, this would be record breaking rent growth. Yeah. I, yeah. I agree. I completely agree with that. I think that also real page is a little bit more of a burden on them. They're always releasing new information almost mm -hmm. like every day. And Yardi matrix really, they're one of the last re monthly reports that come along. Um, I'm always waiting. It's a, they are always about a week or two in the, into the next month. Um, before they released the previous month's report. So maybe they yeah. just kind of, kind of took some time and had a more um, a more or less uh, nuanced, I guess you could say, uh, report for this month. Yeah. Well, just looking at this in this little small, maybe I can zoom in for everybody just so they can see a little bit more. But, you know, there's these looking at the national average rents. This is starting in October 19. 
um, up to October 21 um, and just look at the, 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 the slope of, of rent growth, um, you know, yeah. And now again, this is a year, you know, of, you know, of seeing some slight rent declines during COVID, but then February kicked in, everyone knew what the plan for the, for 2021 was, it looked like. So pretty, pretty fascinating. And then yeah. I, I recommend everybody, so, you know, you can find this report. It's uh, in the Gray Report newsletter. You know, you can sign up for that at graycapitalllc.com slash report. Um, you can also find this stuff over at grayreport.com um, when these reports are um, listed we um we drop those on greatreport.com so you can see them right away and so you know i would take it's a you know relatively long report as matt said i mean well, it's 14 pages but getting into some um you know, detail market by market um yeah you know you mentioned that that slope there in the very beginning that small graph that they mm -hmm. always have kind of at the beginning of their report now last month and i was i i was remember this and it, it is true if you go to the september uh report you see a little bit of a flattening um, in that in that trend line, but in this, that flattening is not there. They've kind of smoothed that out. So it's so they're really kind of it looks like somewhat of a straight line. Yeah. Well, yeah. Implicitly or or explicitly, they are um, they are indicating that there is that the rent cool down is kind of not happening, um, yeah. which I think is it's fairly dramatic. If uh, you really can, um, you know, I'll include the September link in the in the show notes. Um, but the the September rent report does prove it out that they thought maybe a cool down was coming. And then October mm -hmm. cooldown's not coming. Um, so let's contrast this again. You know, we already did a little bit. Uh, you know, again, just the real page. Um, you know, it, it was is it when I when did this was released? This was released. You know, November fourth versus um, the Yardie was released. Um, you know, I guess I guess later. I mean, it's the ninth today in November. Um, but you know, what are the big differences? And you know, Greg Willett, who you know we feature his pieces quite often. Um, I think he's got a really good. Uh, Really, he has a really good sense of what's going on. Um, you know, so they showed, you know, a 0.6% growth, which again, on a normal year, that'd be really strong growth. Um, yeah. But compared exactly. to the one, you know, the 2% uh, monthly growth that we saw, we saw in the summer, um, you know, it's definitely muted. Um, so do is this, I mean, is it just, they've got different, you would think that, the they the results would be somewhat similar because they they had they real page and yardy matrix they're both you know property management software companies they yeah. both have property management that's where they're getting all this information and you could say well maybe they're people who use yardy they're getting high rent growth on real page but it, it's you know they're they're, they're both the, they're the two largest players and you think the sample sizes are large enough that you would see yeah. relatively similar results because i mean i we I think it's amazing see, looking at our portfolio and I see similar, you know, um, kind of macro KPIs that we'll see in, in some of this macro data. And I, I, it's obviously it can be, it can be different, but I'm curious. It's just interesting why well, they're so different. Is, it's, we looked at, this is kind of the same case as what we did last, uh, last week. And, and again, I want to plug it. We went through all of these different reports from um, all of the real big names that are making these multifamily reports and they all had slightly different um slightly different takes some of them were were, were vastly different um so you could i it this is one of those cases where the reports are good reports but it definitely uh pays to to look at all of them and and look kind of to get a larger context of what's happening in the market rather than really relying just on one single I, I think I think that's the most important is you have to look at a lot of different um, pieces of information because they're they're all slightly the the methodology methodologies are a little bit different and I mean like compared to again I, like we looked at last week if you look at you know the 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 BLS numbers versus the real page numbers versus their apartment list numbers versus versus the Yardi numbers you're gonna see different things some are measuring some are actually measuring different things are they you measuring market rent growth or just market rents are you measuring in place rent growth or in place for rents um so you know it's like for this for real page it's monthly change in us effective asking rents for move-in leases um now, I, I assume the yardies is is, is look like doing that is the same but now when they say that they note following normal seasonality so this may not even they may even note that right there following normal seasonality this is kind of a normal thing. And if you look at it, that's what happened in the winter, January, February, March. Those were all 0 0.2, 0 0.6, 0 0.7 rent growth. And then April, it jumped to 1.3 once kind yeah. of the move-in season started. So this, 
it looks a whole lot like a seasonal change rather than a a, a I, I think that market. makes a lot of i think that makes a lot of sense is really yeah anything in the market is yep the seasonality and the reg and the the major growth is also seasonal as well um and then again just to report stay on top of it again as we reported last week occupancy all-time high nationally according to real page 97.3 percent um again you know these are all the variables you know you know and uh of, you know valuing assets and performance these big kpis you know rent growth um occupancy you know because a lot of times you see more rent growth but occupancy might suffer you know at least at a property basis you raise rents okay i'm 97 percent occupied i'll raise rents a little bit um, but i'm still getting a more revenue at being 95 percent occupied but here we're seeing occupancy go up and rents grow up go up and cap rates um continue to compress and um decline and, and matt not to audible um because i want to get into our, our next uh article but you know then there there's a lot of calls and I, and I see this happening for at least for the foreseeable future from globe street um as you know they're saying you know apartment cap rates are likely to remain lo low yeah. um you know and even if we see interest rates rising slightly the amount of revenue growth is going to be able to you know really carry forward um you know these low cap rates um yeah this I, is the this is the you don't want to be the last one off the bus um or you know you don't want to be the last one before before the ride stops um if, if these cap rates may be low now but you you don't no one really knows for sure how long this period of rent growth is going to be and um and that's that's what i'm kind of concerned about and when what i don't know uh will equate yeah. to a runaway increases or inflation or there's a lot of variables and it's hard to make that it's very hard to, to make that prediction of rent growth remaining low so so i i yeah i think well is there's things we know and there's things we don't know i mean we know yeah. that market rents market rents have already and we've talked about this last week we talked about this almost every week we already know that market rents have risen significantly what is it 16 percent nationally um you know that, that that's incredible but again, it's this difference between market rents and in-place rents. And so, so we know that, you know, the actual the in-place rents have only grow, grown by, I think, like 4% year over year. And yeah. so we're going to see all these rents move up 16 percentage points over the next couple of years or two, because you increase renewals typically at a lower rate than new leases. So we know we're going to see just in-place effective rent grow over the next couple of years significantly even if no additional rent growth took place if rent growth was zero percent for the next year we would still see incredible top line revenue and noi growth at multifamily properties yeah what i think is not being why we're going to see cap rates why cap rates have dropped so low and why they will remain low is what is this next stage so like if okay no more inflation is done the prices mm -hmm. can be somewhat justified we're going to get the growth but as rents rise and it's this feedback loop of you know rents and, and wage wages causing inflation if wages pop up the wages and rents pop up even more you know we get into this cyclical loop which yeah. um can be it can be tough for the economy but you know for the apartment as for an apartment investor it can be uh a somewhat attractive situation and it's one of the reasons why we invest in apartments is because we know that this possibility is out there of um, inflation that's why a lot of people get into the space of you know being hedge against inflation allocating to real assets whereas the rent growth is going to outpace inflation i mean this is what we've been saying for years matt of why we invest in it yeah and, and it's been a good investment class and now it's we're actually seeing it happen and you know on one hand that you know i don't want to see i, I don't think we're going to see inflation like we did in the 70s but I, we could see some a couple of years of elevated inflation and that's going to really continue to push um apartment yeah. valuations and what i think eventually what will happen and unless interest rates you know go negative um is that we'll see may, you know maybe a normalization of cap rates cap rates maybe coming up a little bit but, but be, it's only yeah. because valuations of, are going to increase so much because you're you know you're the numerator in the equation the noi has increased so much that you've still you, you made you've doubled the you've you know increased the value of the asset by 50 percent. but you, maybe you don't need the cap rate to do that you're just doing it because you're increasing income at the property yeah. 
Okay. Um, okay, Matt, do you want to get into the end New York Times piece? They they lead off. There's a recent New York Times uh, article on. Um, it says uh, it, it talks about the their eviction worries. It says with cases piling up, an eviction crisis unfolds step by step. They lead this article off with a mention of, of Indianapolis, which I'm sure, uh, <laughs> which I'm sure raised Spencer's eyebrows, um, because we have done our own digging earlier in the year and found that Indianapolis was one of the cities that did not have as strict of an eviction moratorium or as a, 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 as a strict rules against evictions as other cities. We looked at the eviction rates of Indianapolis and Minneapolis, and we looked at occupancy rates as well. Indy may not have had as few of evictions as Minneapolis, but their occupancy rate was higher. There were more people living in apartments in Indianapolis, even though there were uh, even though there were not as strict, you know, rules against evictions in Indianapolis, there were more people living in, in apartments in Indianapolis than there were in Minneapolis. So to say that there is this months long backlog of eviction cases seems like imprecise wording at the very beginning of a nationally distributed New York Times article. Um, but that's just me. And I don't know if you have a strong feelings about it, but well, we did a whole video on it. Yeah, we, we did. We did do a whole video on the eviction moratorium and, we were making the correlation, the connection of some of the best markets to invest in are the markets that had the highest rates of evictions at that time because they're the only markets that were actually functioning, had actual functioning markets um, themselves. I, I'm i wondering if this piece is to almost tag on and try to kind of finish up the conversation of all of the predictions of this eviction tsunami. I mean, the, we're supposed to, we're supposed to have this eviction tsunami and eviction wave, and, and it's oh, yeah. almost like this piece is trying to say like, here it is, but they're not really saying that. They're really yeah. saying is like, evictions are slightly rising nationwide. We don't know where the ceiling is. Yeah. Um. And, and it, it's it's really it's a lot of it's a lot of anecdotes. Um. Mm -hmm. When I was reading, it, it, it seems I like it's a lot agree. of a, of anecdotes of well, you know. Yeah, go ahead. And Matt. that's the thing. These are individually, they are gripping, they're tragedies, and you don't want people to be evicted. Um, but on the macro scale, these tragedies are not occurring at the same rate as they did before the pandemic. It, it, we are still around half the rate as as what we were pre pandemic. So it's kind of I, I don't want to say it mischaracterizes because those are real devastating events for the people that are evicted but they are not happening at the frequency that they were happening before the pandemic. Yeah, they ex exactly. It's like, Oh, people are being evicted. And like, they're just saying that people, the story is that people are being evicted for not paying rent. And, and we should be really like shocked and surprised um, when the, you know, the, there is quite a bit of rental assistance out there and something, man, I was mentioning to you, you know um, I saw this, this article was posted um, in the, uh, on the economic, economics subreddit and there was so much um not correct information and understanding of the situation um from all levels even pro and con against the eviction moratorium almost actually there were, i don't think there was anything really in favor of the eviction moratorium no one could really make sense of it but there's just, just a gross understanding because there's been so many headlines between there is an eviction tsunami and huge fiction crisis and then and then the the rental system funds weren't getting out there, which was true for a while. But now they have been getting out. You know, yeah. we have we have we have plenty. We have multiple residents who have taken advantage of these programs. But now people are saying, "Well, there's no rental assistance," and so it, there's just there, the situation comes off as much worse. And again, it's the media trying to find a story, and yeah. and, and no, and evictions are you know vi these visceral events. And it's like you know, I'm in limbo. I'm about to get evicted. I'm 61 years old. I don't have anywhere to go. And you know, how do you not feel for that? that person and all these other story stories of someone saying, you know, I, you know, I was being evicted and I couldn't make it to my court date. And, you yeah. know, you, you know, getting into the, 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 the minutia of, you know, specific, you know, eviction court proceedings with like, which like spend any time in the court and not get frustrated and seeing how people get, you know, real, you know, run over by the justice system. Like, like, are we, this is not, you know, what's the point of the discussion? You know, are we talking about the the state of, yeah, that's true. you know, the individual renters? Are we talking about the justice system and how courts are handled? You know, there's so many different layers, the rental assistance, the eviction moratorium. And it's, I think, the media trying to find an issue in a boogeyman and, and to get people to keep talking. Um, and they can't, it's hard to say they were wrong because they they were had been saying 
that there's this massive eviction uh, wave coming and the wave isn't here. And they're trying to say like, well, maybe there's not a wave, but like, it's not good. Yeah. It's a tide maybe. Yeah. Exactly. But I, you know, and I, I cited in some of our notes, you know, they were, they were talking about an eviction tsunami. They were talking about an eviction avalanche and now it's, yeah, it's a, the, the flow rate is lower, much lower than they anticipated. And yeah, I think it, be the, hot, the headline instead of, you know, we're, we have this imagined crisis that's unfolding, or, unfolding. Or just like evictions proceeding as expected, you know, yeah. It's as normal. There are evictions taking place if people don't didn't pay rent. Like, but that yeah. who's going to read that of being like, eh, things are kind of going relatively how they were. Mm -hmm. um, so, Matt, I want to talk about this infrastructure bill first. You want to mm -hmm. talk about this apartmentless page about how does Gen Z feel about home ownership? And this is so important because you know Gen Z, they're the next demographic cohort that is already um, our renters and are going to continue to make up a big chunk of the renting uh, demographic. And it's on the margins of we're, of we're, we're learning with millennials of when do they decide, all right, I want to live in a home. And then the next question of, do I want to actually purchase a home? And is the uh, American dream to have a house or place to live with enough room to do what you want to do, or is the American dream yep. um, actual home ownership in the thirty-year fixed mortgage? The, you know, is the dream to yeah. go into well debt and I, to debt to do that? I, yeah, I think this ties in really well with the um, with the Yardi Matrix. Uh, you know, them tracking single-family rentals. Um, Gen Z is the next gen. They're a little bit, a little less interested in home in owning a home than millennials. And they're definitely less optimistic about affording one in the next 10 years, which I think tracks with anyone at an age at that age group. That's like perfectly logical that a younger generation would would yeah. not be but able I, to afford is, it. Is the um, is the finding though that, that the current Gen Z is least optimistic than previous generations? Or do they do they, they don't measure them against a Gen X or, or baby boomers or anything like that? They this is just comparing Gen Z, younger and older millennials. And What's interesting is that Gen Z still values home ownership. They they think it's important. More than half of them, or, or around half at least, think it's either very or extremely important. Um, but they don't. Uh, but they don't think that it's attainable. And I think that that attainability is where you might see people that want to live in a house, but they don't own one or they can't afford one. Um, it's it seems like uh, an easy choice to make that. Uh, you know, that really could be the reason why the single family home ha has kicked into gear this year. Um, generations now collectively are interested, again, in living, but not owning a home, paying a little yeah. extra rent for a yard, privacy, more room to raise a family. All of these generations that they're tracking, these are going to be the ones in the next 10, 15 years that start to build families. And if they want that space, either a yard or that they they can have the American dream that uh, in terms of where they're living, but it just doesn't involve a, a mortgage. Yeah. Basically. You know, I, I feel like this is part of um, kind of, I'd say, Gen Z and millennials. And I would say, you know, younger Gen Xers also just being a little bit more financially savvy and taking a little bit more control of our finances because, you know, we most jobs don't have pension plans. You, you know, we have to invest. We have to, you know, kind of be thinking about, you know, retirement and really taking control of that, you know, you know, social security, you know, good, good luck. You know, if that's actually even going to be there, you know, when, when we get to be, you know, 65 or 62, when, you know, whenever we are eligible for social security and, and also, you know, having some, you know, maybe some distrust of kind of the, you know, wall street and, you know, financial markets in general, I think that's why there's, you know, a huge interest in cryptocurrencies, alternative investments and, and then if you look about it, if you step back and say, okay, if I need to invest for my future, if I do have the money for a down payment on a house, okay, that means, you know, I have the, I have the ability to make an investment. I mean, that's really what that means. Instead of like, yeah. I'm going to go and buy a house because I have, now it's time to buy a house. I'm at the age where I have to buy a house. It's, hey, all right, I have a nest egg. What do I want to do with this nest egg? Do I want to yeah. invest? Do I want to be, have my nest egg concentrated into one asset that I'm emotionally tied to. Again, not saying that home ownership hasn't isn't a great tool that's 
been used to build wealth. It, it certainly has regenerations, but is it the best, is it the best tool, you know, take that same amount that you would have put that bought your house and, you know, throw it in a, you know, an S and P 500, uh, you know, index fund. Um, and let that sit for 30 years and see what the value is going to be. Or if you want to invest in real estate, is it the best real estate investment? Yeah. You know, is it, is it, is it going to be, you know, it gets back to, you know, rich dad, poor dad, you know, liability and the liabilities and assets. And is it something that's going to put money in your pocket or take money out of your pocket? And homes are major liabilities. Um, if you rent, landlord takes care of it. You take that nest egg invested in the apartment syndication or you're do buy your own rental property or buy a REIT if you know if that's your if it floats your but what what it doesn't matter but just focusing on what's the best what is the best allocation how should I allocate my capital that I have because if you don't see yourself as a capital allocator and with the goal of buying assets as opposed to just I need to buy a house why do you yeah. need to buy a house you need you need a place to live you want a place to raise your family you want some space but that doesn't mean well, you have to, that's, you need to make that your only investment. Yeah. And that's, and I think that that's the key is the frame of mind of buying a house. That's a once in a lifetime, sometimes, you know, maybe twice or three times. It's not the, it's not like buying a sandwich. These are not transactions that people are used to, and they're not bringing the full brunt of logic um, necessarily mm -hmm. to that, yeah. to that decision because they just don't have the experience and they can't kind of process it outside of maybe the kind of traditions of, of owning a home. So I think that that's a really good point is there's probably other places, but what usually is done is you buy a house and you kind of can get caught up in the moment in the momentum yeah. there without considering alternatives. Yeah. Well, and I think there's a lot of, you know, keeping up with the Joneses and just a lot of, you know, it's time for us to buy a house and there's security in it. And, um, mm -hmm. but I think for a lot, if you talk to a lot of Gen Z individuals and even millennials, Okay, I'm going to give you um, sixty-seven thousand dollars. You'll say you have sixty-seven thousand dollars. Do you want to buy one Bitcoin, full Bitcoin, or you want to put that as a down payment in a house? Purely financial decision. What do you think is going to be worth more in the next ten years? Now, yeah. you can say I don't, you don't like Bitcoin or whatever, and that that's fine. But I think the merit of it doesn't matter. It's what are Gen Zers thinking. What do you think? I, you know, maybe a hand, a, the majority will probably take the house, but I think it's a surprisingly yeah. high number who would be like, I'm buying Bitcoin because the Bitcoin is going to be worth a million dollars in five or 10 years that my house is going to maybe, maybe at best increase 30 to 50% value. Maybe if it doubles in value. So you buy a $300,000 yeah. home, you have a $600,000 home versus, you know, being able to go to. Yeah. The I would say that. I, yeah. I don't think that it's, the American, you know, culture of home home ownership is not going to flip overnight. But these gradual changes, because of the entrenched nature of you know home ownership as the American dream, et cetera, uh, these gradual changes are significant, and yep. uh, really they will benefit the rental market too. too. Yep. Okay, so we teased about the infrastructure, and I'm gonna we're gonna I think that. So what do you, what do you think, Matt? Um, infrastructure or uh, employment? Well, wages. Um, what, what you know, you, they kind of I are can, all sort of tied together, sort of yeah, relation. I think but, we can um, discuss them as a group because the infrastructure yeah, bill, um, I, I can really fly through it. There's not a lot of Let's, details that I could f find out yet. I'm still digging for them. Um, <laughs> you'll so, find stick, out. so, yeah, I mean, it's, I think, that, I think there's a break, the rough breakdown of the spending. I think it's like, what, yeah. like a hundred and some billion of, you know, roads and bridges. There's airport funding. There's funding for, you know, uh, charging networks, green infrastructure, um, you know, the um, rate updating, uh, railroads, um, you know, lock systems on the so waterways. What I, was, what I was control effing or Apple F what I, I, you know, housing, where's housing. I've heard housing it's not for a, the past it's, two years. It, yeah. But that's in the, the build back better bill. It may be in the build back better, but there was one small, uh, there was some, some small, uh, mention of it in an article about the infrastructure bill. That said that there will that will it will include investments in affordable housing. Now I don't think you know the lack of specificity doesn't give me confidence, um, but I think that uh, I think that what they is, may have been conflating the two, and there's been a lot yeah. of that. There's been yeah. there's been some some intentional conflating of the two because they are very starkly different. Um, but so there's this been is what I, just the one thing I wanted to 
talk about it is like this bill, or at least the dream of it, has been kicking around policymakers' imaginations for the better part of a decade. Um, but it's worth noting that this bill's passage does come at a time when it's become costly, both in terms of time and money, to ship goods around the country. Uh, will roads and bridges solve the labor process that's involved in, you know, that it's really a labor problem that's uh, that's that's behind all these logistics issues. I don't think that that's going to solve it right away, and neither will these roads and bridges get built right away. But all that being said, there are a lot worse places for government investment than ones that aid commerce in this way. So yes, there's going to be, and it's going to contribute to inflation. Um, but it is, but it is interesting. It is this is an investment in in logistics related. Um, religious, just logistics related infrastructure at a time when really we're having that exact problem. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, you know, it's on one hand, it's like, yeah, you more spending is going to, you know, pro most likely add a degree to inflation. It's another over a you know, trillion dollars. But at, at the same time, you know, everyone's going to be complaining about, hey, our bridges are, you know, roads and bridges are crumbling. And we do have, you know, second rate infrastructure compared to China. And how do you compete on a global scale? Um, obviously it's, you know, the federal government spending trillions of dollars is going to be a ton of waste and probably misused funds, but, you know, I'm, I'm open to other alternatives to get these projects done. Um, but I think a lot of these things do need to get done. It is real infrastructure. Um, now the social infrastructure package that has not yet been passed, it hasn't even been, the details aren't written. That's, that's what's the, is the more of the do what of this do we really need and it's really that's what's gonna grow government in a way that that really could be dangerous um and i would say that there are a lot of wants not needs um probably not all um but that's and again it's the we're a center right you know country and i think the infrastructure bill is more or less center and you know the build back better social infrastructure is you know not even it's center left to left and that's just not necessarily where the, where the country is um i like the name infrastructure bill i don't like any of the fancy names i mean the, the friends and economy bill there's all these like very generic names infrastructure bill great name what i don't like is the one trillion dollar bill or the 555 billion spending bill or the 1.2 trillion if you put that number on it then it's hard not to think about the knock-on effects on inflation when you're throwing those big numbers around yeah just uh in the list on the npr piece you know roads and bridges 110 billion passenger uh, and freight rail 66 billion public transit 40 39 billion and i think a lot of that is to just to make um public transit more accessible to the elderly um yeah. 25 billion in for airports 17 billion for port infrastructure matt to your point getting supplies in Again, this is going to help us now when we have the problem. Yeah. Transportation safety programs, eleven billion dollars. Electric vehicles, seven and a half billion dollars. Um, zero in low emission buses and ferries, seven and a half billion. Um, revitalization of communities, whatever that means, is one billion. Then um, other infrastructure, broadband, internet, sixty-five billion. Power infrastructure. I'm just going to say, I'm not going to say billion anymore. Power infrastructure, seventy-three. Uh, clean drinking water, fifty-five billion. Um, resilience and resilience in Western water storage. 50 billion removal of pollution from water and soil 21. So, I mean, it's a lot of money, a lot, a lot of money, a lot, a lot of money. And I, I was still in this, there's some criticism. Um, and I think it's there. I think it's partially due partially. There is a lot of other infrastructure. Um, like I know this power infrastructure is going to also, it's a lot of cybersecurity infrastructure as well. Um, so we don't like the grid doesn't get, um, hacked as frequently. Um, but it's like, oh, you know, you think of it, of infrastructure as, oh, you know, roads and bridges and, you know, that's, you know, uh, you know, 10, you know, basically 10%, but there's obviously a lot more going on. It's the, I mean, the resilience and Western water storage, 50 billion. That's a nice chunk. So pretty neat. nifty. Okay. And so this, now that this is going to kind of just, um, you know, dovetail into, um, employment rate, employment activity uh in the economy so we're talking inflation we're talking about just the how the economy is going to be is looking is going to look i think you know obviously man going to see elevated growth elevated rates of inflation but this is a good sign you know if yeah. the economy's in i i think Great obviously up, a lot yeah. is effed up but there's a lot to be i think optimistic about yeah 
And it wasn't despite anything, it wasn't with this looming in the background. It was very plain. It rose in October with 531,000 new jobs. Um, and it was it was an improvement from last month. I really think that we're kind of getting past the the uh, the Delta surge fully at this point. There is no like, there. You know, there are some minor reports, but at this point, there's no no one has uh, is raising the alarm bells of a new surge or a new variant. Um, there are some real reasons for optimism in the economy. And another note, it was this, this was in another article, was that uh, wages are up 4.9 percent year over year. Yeah. Now that's a little bit more of an alarm bell. You know, rent is up, wages are up, gas prices, government spending, interest rates remain low. Spencer, should I start buying canned food, foods and toilet paper before prices shoot up uncontrollably? I, I don't know. There is all of these ingredients, and I don't want to be a doomsayer, but it's it's a lot. You know, I I, I agree that that uh, 531,000 new jobs is an unalloyed good. There's no you know there's no bad part about these new jobs, but the wages if they start creeping up significantly, that's the, we're and we're not even we haven't even begun to taste the real rent increases that that have happened. Those will happen again. We're going to start hearing about all this stuff. Um, it's just an ingredients for inflation that uh, seems almost overdetermined. At the, at the but so what? So the problem is. What I love, what I love about this situation is like the like the concern is the worst. The bad things are are all good things. Uh, no, like, I know. Like, 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 like wages, wages are growing. Wage wages are growing, and prices. You know, market markets are up. Yeah. Now, well, there's always something to worry about. Uh. Well, <laughs> if it's the opposite, it'd be like certainty. We're we're going to continue on the on the decline. But things look really great. Yeah. Good hiring. Mark's really good. Top line revenue growth, and that's the thing. Like the stock market, it, it's not. It, I mean, valuations now are very high. Um, they're they're high, but it's because of the revenue growth. We're seeing the top line. Mm -hmm. or the re, it, it's the earnings, and it's the it's the revenue growth. It's the top line, just like we're seeing in the rent growth. And so that's why you can justify the higher valuations because you see continued rent earnings growth in the future. And and the the negative is just like oh well, markets are high. You know, what, what must, goes, must goes up, must comes down yeah. without like, that's like not the only, they're also higher highs lead to high, higher, highest of highs, all time highs lead to more all time highs. Yeah. Continually. And, and this is another thing too, is like, we, this is such an, such a strange situation really hasn't, we're, we're not fully finished with the recovery yet. We're, we're, we're well into it. We're all, you know, I, I, there are still elements that are still recovering. Labor force participation is still not at, at what it once was. So it's hard to really say that we're fully recovered. Um, so, so it's, yeah, yeah. We're not fully recovered. So how do you predict? So I, you know, the, people say the cure for high prices is high prices. And, and, but, and before we see evidence of, you know, people are reacting, uh, reacting to high prices and they're willing to spend more and they keep going and keep going. We just don't have enough data. I don't think to really make a good long-term prediction. Well, and but, what we uh, thought, I am but, worried. Yeah. I, I am worried. I think it's good to always be cautious and to, you yeah. know, have a good sense and not be too compla complacent. And that's not yeah. what I yeah. want to get off as, of as all, all looks good. I, I think I'm just, this is just my take from seeing what I see and it's, it gets more views and likes to talk about how things are going to crash and and, yeah. and create scenarios of you know a re another recession coming up. Well, uh, but at the same time, I I and and I agree. I I think I have a distaste of being a doomsayer. But what you're saying is is ultimately a more valuable perspective. You want to find out where what's going to go well. That's where you make that's that's where you make good investment decisions. Is finding out what's What's great, yeah. you know, what to look forward. I mean, to. it's also mitigating, you know, quantifying, quantifying, and mitigating risk. I mean, that that yeah. that it's also huge. That that is e an equal part of it. But it's if you can't identify, if you're only focused on risk and you're not identifying opportunities as they present themselves, and you know, if you just stick your, you know, you you, you headed back into the shell just because it's too confusing, and that that's where I think it is. It's just too much. It's too much change too quickly. Yeah, we're not. We're not. We're we're playing we're we're fighting the last war, we're mm -hmm. skating to where the puck is versus where it's going, and yeah. I I see this as a high, I think it's much more probable that we are going to that we are entering in or already in a real a Goldilocks period of you know 
solid growth, but inflation not being, you know, running hot, but not too hot with relatively still low interest rates and lower unemployment. I mean, we, 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 you know, we kick stagflation down, you know, going over that, um, that, that piece last week. Yeah. You can't have stagflation with, when, when unemployment is, is so low and yeah. we've recovered so quickly. It's very true. Yeah. Which reports that unemployment rate in next year's is forecast to be around 3%, you know, basically getting to the previous, um, cycles low that took a decade to achieve. Um, mm -hmm. So that certainly there's no like stagflation just needs to be like, all right, that's not inappropriate. That's not where we're headed at all. Um, the only reason why people talk about stagflation is because of last month's job report of not being, you know, record breaking. So they're like, oh, well, you know, job growth is slowing. Are we going to see stagflation? It's just, just not the case. So I, th yeah. I think there's much more to be optimistic about than there is to be concerned about. Um, can things get crazy? Absolutely. Just have to assume they will be at some point. Again, that's why, again, that's why we're doing what we do and we're investing in the sectors we invest in. If you'll keep looking for reasons for doom, you're going to miss some opportunities. Um, I say, yeah, like be aware, be aware of the risks, but know that this is a time of opportunity. And, um, and if you're worried too much, you're going to miss it. Yeah, I think that's I think that's the case. And you know, I've talked to people who you know still have big a lot of people have big cash positions right now. Maybe they've you know they've closed out some investments, um, which is reasonable. But then it's like, okay, where where are we going to put it? How do you allocate it? And when things are at an all time high, you don't like the idea of buying high. Um, but I think it's it's also a great risk to be holding so much cash um, and not being allocated to assets, because you know I think that you know cash is a great ballast to one's portfolio, you know, it really, it can center, you know, the entire portfolio, but you know, too much cash and overweight can really sink a portfolio. Also, you don't need that much weight on a ship. You need enough to keep it steady and safe. Um, you want most of your portfolio allocated assets are going to be working for you and doing something. Yeah. So, all right, Matt, um, Gav, anything exciting plan for rest of your week? What's, what's going on in, uh, Boss Noggle. Breaking household. leaves. Oh, this leaves. is going to be another great oh. weekend of raking leaves. And do you do you burn the leaves or do you bag we, the leaves? Do you mulch the leaves? We compost? bag them and, and I have a suck a succopator that sucks up the leaves. Um, it's not really efficient, but still like. Wait, well, is it like a blower, but like works in reverse? Yes, exactly. Well, that's much, like the, the, the pros. Than, yeah, yeah. Okay, so you're actually, you're, 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 you're sucking them into the bags? Second That's the way to go. So you're, you're so you're vacuuming you're vacuuming the leaves. Yeah, but it does not work as efficiently as you might imagine it. It's still I still do it because I like it. So you're not you're not just blowing the leaves on like on the out in the the street or in your neighbor's yard. Okay, you're not, a good. You're I love good my neighbor. neighbors. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, good. Yeah, that's right. That's good. Yeah, I've had a good uh, leaf burn. I feel like people don't burn. You don't. I, I think it's illegal to burn leaves. Actually, you know, in, in especially in Indianapolis. I, actually, for sure, yeah. for for sure, it is. <laughs> Um, yeah. um, has it stopped us in the past, hey, but, um, it used to, I feel like, uh, it was more common. You used to always, there'd be somebody burning some leaves and sure, yeah. you know, well, it's dry outside. Not the best thing to do. I just, we don't have forest fires here in Indiana folks, you know, maybe California. I don't, I don't know when the last forest fire in Indiana was, but we, that's, but you still want to be careful in a dry environment. You don't want to just mm -hmm. be lighting things on fire, but, um, it, it was, it was part of fall kind of, you know, smelling that, uh, that leaf burning session somebody was doing <sighs> somewhere. That's okay. <laughs> It's, it's, it's a little things. <laughs> All right, everyone. If you're not subscribed to the Great Capital YouTube channel, give us a subscription just right now. It's right in that that bottom left corner. Make sure you like this video and leave us a comment, um, letting us know, know uh, whether you thought we were on top of it and you like what we said, or if you again you think we just don't know what we're talking about. We'd love to hear your response. And you know, if someone needs to see this, um, get them up to date. Share this with them as well. Um, and a reminder, you can really stay up to date every single day over at grayreport.com. And but if you are not receiving the Gray Report newsletter, you can find that at grayreport.com or graycapitalllc.com slash newsletter. Um, we really appreciate you watching this video, taking the time. Um, means a lot to us if you watch the whole video. Um, all right, Matt, again, really appreciate you, Thank you. putting the new report together. Again, it comes out every Thursday at 8 30 in the morning eastern eastern standard time no matt let me ask you a question 
does the when the report goes out on Thursday at 8:30 Eastern Standard Time, do folks out uh, in California does it go out 8:30 PST or does it go out at 6:30 or when whenever um, it goes out? I send them all out immediately. Um, yeah, so there's no advantage. I don't want to give the Eastern Time. So they're, or... so they're getting so they're getting into 3:30. In the morning, they're getting it. They're getting it at five thirty. At five thirty Pacific time. Yeah. Five. Yeah. So math. Hey, perfect. Wake up early. Get going. There's no. I don't want to give any any coast advantages. Pacific is going to get the same info at the same time. So hey, wake up earlier. I guess wake up earlier. We 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 chose to live live in the time zone that just wakes up a little earlier. I guess. You get, they've got the weather, so it's all good. Okay, all right. Appreciate you watching this video again. Hope you have a good one. Take it easy.